The voice of the Lord is powerful and full of majesty. May the Lord bless us with God's peace. The voice of the Lord proclaimed Jesus as God's beloved. In our own baptisms, we are claimed as God's beloved. Let us worship God. On this baptism of the Lord Sunday, we remember our baptisms where we were claimed as children of the covenant and beloved of God. Yet we live as those who were alienated from God. We've turned away from God, one another, and the earth. Let us confess our sins, trusting in God's mercy. Let us pray. Merciful God, we confess that we are estranged from you and from one another. We treat others as strangers rather than as people created in your image and fellow children of God. We exploit the earth as though it were our possession rather than a gift entrusted to our care and a reflection of your image and glory. Forgive us our sins and transform us by your Spirit that we might live as people who have been baptized as your own children. Amen. Friends, hear the good news of the gospel and of Jesus' solidarity in his own baptism by John with all who have been immersed in baptismal waters, repenting of their sin. God has forgiven us of our sins and set us on new paths. Let us remember our baptisms and trust in God's mercy to restore our right standing as God's own. Thanks be to God. Amen. Hello, everyone. Hope you're doing well. Look what I found, a cotton plant, and it survived the harvest. As you know, the past few months, farmers have been harvesting their cotton a day in and day out. Well, this kind of reminded me of something about cotton. Take a look at the, the bush and the cotton bulbs or the bowls and the roots and my sweater. This is one of my favorite sweaters and it is 100% cotton. Now, if I trace my sweater back to, the, to its origin, to its beginning, I wonder what I would discover. Where did it come from? Yeah, I know it came from the store and it came from the sweater maker, but if I went further back, on back, way back, it came from a cotton plant, from the cotton, the cotton that was worked into thread, the thread that was worked into fabric, and the fabric that was worked into a sweater or a shirt. Well, take a look at the roots of this, co this cotton plant. Look how wide and spread out they are. Think about the farmer who planted the seed. Well, first, he got the soil ready for the seed. The seed was put in the soil. The soil was receptive of the seed. He nurtured the ground and the cotton bush began to, to grow. What if the roots weren't so deep and wide? What if they didn't extend out 
and get the nutrients from the ground and the water that fed the plant, that fed the, the cotton ball. I think there's a lesson in that for us. We need to be sure that we're planted, well, in the right stuff. And what I mean by that is, as children of God, let's be sure that our roots go deep and go wide in the right stuff. Jeremiah told the people one day, one of my favorite verses, Jeremiah 17, 7. He said, Thus saith the Lord, Happy is the one whose trust is the Lord and whose confidence is in the Lord. For they are like a tree planted by a stream, a tree that extends its roots out to the waters and does not fear in times of heat and does not worry in a year of drought. For its leaves will be green and it will always produce fruit. Well, what kind of fruit is Jeremiah talking about? I think Paul gave a pretty clear definition of that fruit in Galatians when he said, you are to bear fruit from the Spirit. In other words, from the Spirit of God, from the Spirit of Christ, from the very character of God Himself. And that fruit is what? Well, he defined it and identified it as being kindness, gentleness, patience, understanding, love, peace, self-control. I think we could all use that kind of fruit today. And you know, everything that he described the fruit of the Spirit as, they're action words. So, as we plant ourselves in the right stuff, the Spirit of God, and we produce the fruit, the action fruit of peace, love, kindness, acceptance, understanding, we need to be sure and act on that. You know, we need it. Our neighbors need it. Our whole nation needs it. We have had one year of heat and drought. So let's not grow weary, nor be afraid, but trust God in every step of the way. And may we bear that fruit. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your love and your grace. Remind us every day to whom we belong, and that is you. We are children of yours. So may we be rest assured in our beliefs and our faith that you are with us every step of the way. Remind us to ground ourselves in the good stuff, the stuff that Paul talked about in your spirit, and to be kind, loving, patient, gentle, forgiving to others. And may we put our faith and our fruit in action. Just as this cotton plant produced its cotton fruit, may we produce the fruits of the Spirit. In your name we pray. Amen.
Our scripture reading is from Acts, the 19th chapter, beginning with the first verse. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed by the interior regions and came to Ephesus, where he found some disciples. And he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? And they replied, No, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then he said, Into the, what then were you baptized? And they answered, Into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was, come, was to come after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul had laid his hands on him, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Together there were about 12 of them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. One morning while I was living in Tennessee, I was on my way to the church and I noticed that mixed in with melting snow and those early signs of spring, sunlight reflected off bits of discarded Christmas tinsel. It was a vague reminder of Christmas, discarded tinsel icicles caught in the, in the grass where a cast off Christmas tree had been dragged to the sidewalk waiting to be tossed onto the trash truck. I felt a little sad, actually, recalling the beauty of the Christmas season, the music, the decorations, so much excitement. The season comes and goes so quickly. Just two weeks ago, we celebrated the birth of Jesus Christ. And this past Wednesday, about 18 or so of us gathered out on the front lawn with candles to celebrate Epiphany, the official end of the Christmas season. The word epiphany means to show or to make known or even to reveal. For us in the Christian, word, Christian world, the world most often is a reminder of the arrival of the wise men at the place where Christ was born. The wise men revealed or made known to the world Jesus as Lord and King. The month of December leading up to Christmas is rife with visible reminders of Christmas. But there is more to experiencing the birth of Christ than those outward expressions. To truly experience Christ is to commit wholeheartedly to following Jesus. The wise men were totally committed to finding the Christ child. They set their sights on a star that marked the place of Jesus' birth. And nothing would stop them until they found that sacred light. So for another year, Christmas is over and a whole year of opportunity is ahead. We can take a cue from the wise men with a renewed commitment of our own search for the Christ child. In the business of our daily routines, it's easy to miss the blessing of an encounter with the Holy One. These encounters lead us to find peace in the midst of chaos. An encounter with the Holy One gives us strength to make it through another day and gives us hope for tomorrow. The blessings of the Holy One are yours, not for the asking, but merely for the receiving. In your own search for the Christ child, you must take the time and make the room in your heart to receive all that God wants to do for you. It is all because of the birth of Jesus that the door to God's blessing in our lives has been opened. One writer says this about Jesus. He was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in another obscure visit, village where he worked as a carpenter. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never went to college, never visited a big city. He never traveled more than 200 miles from the place where he was born. He did none of the things usually associated with greatness. He had no credentials but himself. He was only 33. His friends ran away and one of them denied him. He was turned over to his enemies and went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. While dying, his executioners gambled for his clothing, the only property he had. And when he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. 
21 centuries have come and gone, and today Jesus is the central figure of the human race and the leader of mankind's progress. All the armies that have ever marched, all the navies that have ever sailed, all the parliaments that have ever sat, all the kings that ever reigned, put together have not affected the life of mankind on earth as powerfully as that one solitary life. The wise men discovered this solitary life. And when they were confronted with the power of God's love through this solitary life, Jesus Christ, they were guided by God back to their homes along a different route because they were different. Their hearts were changed in the presence of the holy. The Apostle Paul was changed by this solitary life, so changed, in fact, that he left the life of persecuting and murdering of Christians to share the gospel of Jesus Christ's love. In Romans, we read about this. I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. Hence my eagerness to proclaim the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed through faith, for faith, as it is written, the one who is righteous will live by faith. After his conversion, Paul described an overwhelming desire to share his faith. He felt an obligation to God as a result of his salvation. And Paul's focus was 100% on the gospel. He was committed to sharing the gospel with anyone who would listen Jews, Greeks, barbarians, farmers, business people, Democrats, Republicans, independents, anyone, regardless of their race, their social level, or their educational background. It was out of a heart of gratitude that Paul felt this obligation to share the gospel. Paul took to heart the words of Jesus in John 14, 15, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. After the wise men encountered the Christ child, they were changed. After Paul encountered Jesus Christ, he was changed. We've all encountered Christ. Have you been changed? Perhaps this year you too could leave the manger by a different route. Perhaps this could be the year that you commit to sharing the good news of the gospel and to do it with excitement and eagerness. Tell someone how God has worked in your life. If you, like Paul, love Jesus, renew your commitment to keep his commandments. After Christ commissioned the disciples, he leaves them with the same promise he leaves with us. Remember, I am with you always to the end of age. This is indeed the good news of the gospel. We should claim it, and we should share it. It is because our lives have been touched by this birth of love in Jesus Christ that we live and give and care as we do. It is because our lives are grasped by the Spirit of Christ that we got up this morning and we did our best, and sometimes we wanted to sing. It is because we are in love with this vision of life that we have hope, no matter what, and a reason to be and laugh and reach out. It makes all the difference because this celebration was just a reminder to keep our eyes open to the God around us, the Christ beside us, and the Spirit that is in us. Thanks be to God. Amen.